What they had to do was they had to hit military targets. Now, that's the sound that people in the cities of London, Manchester, Bristol, Birmingham, Coventry, fear the most. That means that there is an imminent air raid in progress. German bombers have been sighted coming over the coast and they are heading for the centre of Nottinghamshire. They are heading for Nottingham and they are heading for the cities around Nottingham where a lot of valuable war work was being undertaken. Now, as you can see, you have police here. The police will be the first ones on the streets and they will be telling people if there are MH shelters to get into those shelters as soon as possible. You will also have the ARPs, the Air Raid Prevention Wardens. Their job is to try and assess where an air raid is going to hit to get people into the shelters as well, to make sure at night time that no chinks of light are left exposed for enemy bombers to see and use as a target. Somebody with a main light on in their living room without their curtains closed, German aircraft can see that up to 25,000 feet. So therefore they will be able to use that as a target marker for their bombs to drop. And you can hear the droning of the Dorniers and the Heinkels as they come over in huge waves. And the big sound that people fear the most is the sound of the whistling noise made by the airfoils on the bombs. When these bombs fiddle, they fall in six of bombs and they fall down on top of everyone. In the far distance, you can hear bombs falling. The sound of the siren will go on for quite some time while the air raid is in progress to try and get as many people away as possible. Now, one thing we need to watch out for is some of the buildings around here serve as both places where people live, but also as storage plants. So essential stores of smelter, including chemicals. Now if chemicals are stored in a building, that could be very serious if it is hit by a bomb. Because that can magnify any explosion tenfold. Consequently, now one of the policemen has spotted a fire. Now the ARP man throws away his cup of tea and rushes over to his friends. Now you see some of the ARPs there, they have actually got buckets of water and stirrup pumps. What they're going to be doing is they're going to be using those stirrup pumps to try and put out as much of the initial fire as possible. It may look like nothing at all, but it is actually quite effective. When Germany first started changing over from strategic bombing of military establishments over to hitting civilian targets, they hit the hit civilians quite spectacularly with anti-personnel devices such as butterfly bombs, butterfly mines. Now, the policeman has just informed me that there is orange smoke coming from that building. That means there's chemicals in there. That means it's an extraordinarily dangerous situation for them to find themselves in. And you can see that there's members of the armed forces have rushed away. These are men who are on leave, who are here in the town, and they have rushed to try and help out as much as possible. Now, some people are running over there, setting up an aid station. Some of the first people to evacuate from that building are children. Now, that was an explosion within that building. That could have been a painting going up, or it could have been chemicals igniting. If it's chemicals igniting, this is a very serious situation. And now we have the National Fire Service and the Auxiliary Fire Service's tenders coming in. The first tender, of course, the largest of the ladders. That ladder will reach up to the top of that building there and they will eventually be able to put water down on top of the fire. More casualties are being brought out. Now some of these anti-personnel mines, when they were dropped in civilian areas, would literally explode at about six foot high. So consequently the casualties would be hit full on in the face. The worst ones were when children found these and they didn't know what a butterfly mine was. So consequently, they started using them as a toy. And that's how many children were very seriously hurt during World War II in this country because of mines like that. Now you can see the fire engine being set up 
what they have to do is they have to connect up to the water sur supply that's within their truck. There will also be water supplies all the way around with stand ports that they will be able to use to put that water onto the fire. Now this is very much a joint effort. You have the ARP, you have off-duty soldiers, you have policemen, you have all the people coming together to try and put this fire out. And there's thick, cloying smoke coming out of there. Now they're still bringing out casualties, and some of these casualties look to be very badly hurt indeed. That man there looks like he has actually been hit by flying debris, possibly glass, from an explosion. The other thing to bear in mind is that a lot of people come out and they will look perfectly fine, but they won't be. They have inhaled too much smoke. They're like walking ghosts. Basically, their lungs have been burnt from the inside, and those people often will find that they die shortly afterwards. They look perfectly fine, but they can't breathe. They can't get the breath into their bodies. But you can see one woman here, and she is severely injured. They've managed to get her out, but she is very badly injured. Now, they're going to bring an ambulance up here, the ambulance service. By the way, all of this is happening while enemy bombs are still falling. Everybody who took part in these knew exactly what the risks were. They knew that they could die whilst trying to help their fellow citizens. And they didn't stop for a second to think about that. They just went in and they helped as much as they could. The casualties once again before now. One of the, the fire hoses has been able to start up. Now you notice with this fire hose, ladies and gentlemen, they're not pouring it straight at the flames. What they're doing is they're aiming it up and they're showering water onto the fire side. Sooner or later they'll get one, maybe two more hoses onto it, and again they will put water up into the air and allow it to drop down. Now, sometimes this will happen. Sometimes there will be a kink in the line and the water will stop flowing. Quite often, by the way, in places such as London, when the fire services went out and started fighting the fires, bombs would actually be falling all over and they would take out the fire trucks themselves, killing all the firemen, or they would hit the water supply, or they would set the River Thames on light. The actual Thames itself would burn with the amount of oil on the surface from burning ships. A lot of oil ships were decked, decked along the Thames, so consequently oil was everywhere. Now these casualties will be assessed by the firemen and they will say if there's no doctor around they will try and triage these patients. They will try and say which one's the most seriously hurt, which one needs to go to hospital first. The most seriously wounded will be got in and they're bringing in another fire truck as well. The police playing an invaluable role here because they're keeping people out of the way of these oncoming trucks. There is, of course, a grim reality. If the people that they take out are so seriously hurt that they cannot be saved, then they have to be left where they are. If they can't be saved, they have to be left where they are, and those they can save will be taken and they will be put into the ambulances instead. It's a grim reality of life under fire. Now, these men, all of them, with all the services, the ARPs, the firemen, the police, the wardens, all of them did such an important job that they actually made a feature film about them in World War II, part of a propaganda move that they did to try and get the American public behind them. And that was called Fires Were Started. And it was an incredibly popular film in America because it showed them exactly what the British fire people did during the day. There was a reason for this. There were two actors in it. The rest of them, they were actually firefighters and they went out and fought actual fires during the filming. So that's why it was so wonderful of a film and that's why it's such an evocative film even to this day, showing the bravery of the men and women that took part in these things. Now they're clearing a space now, there is a very serious injured woman here, they think she can be saved, they're taking her to a first aid station. 
So she's been cleared out to a first aid station. And now if you go and have a look at this fire truck, you'll see there is a gentleman, a very brave man indeed, standing at the top there. Now he's got a belt around his waist and he'll clip that belt on, which means that when he's up there and he's using the hose, he'll say he's ready to right just now and it goes up further. And it will keep going up and up and up. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, in a fire situation, the winds can buffet it between 60 and 90 miles an hour while the fire is going on. Fires create their own weather vortexes. He's up there in those winds, very much exposed. So it takes an incredibly brave man to go up there. Now you can see, he's right up there, they're swinging the tender around, the ladder is coming around, the turntable ladder. And they're sort of pouring this on. But those of you unfortunate enough to be over in that corner are probably getting a fine spray of water. Those of you over here, I'm afraid you're going to have to wait your turn. They still don't know what they're dealing with. They've been able to get in and get most of the casualties out, but they still have no clear idea what is going on. Firemen will have to actually enter that building, and when they do, they're going to have to try and find out what it is that they're dealing with. Ambulance is coming back now. There'll be more casualties to take in there. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody is filming this today, we would very much like you to come and talk to the fire services afterwards because we'd like to be able to show the films on the website for the NFS and the AFS. Now, you see what they're doing? They're attacking the fire from two different sources now. They're pouring water up and down fine sprays of water, blanketing the fire, not trying to hit it directly. If you hit it directly, it doesn't work. So consequently, they have to push the fire downwards, suffocating it under a blanket of water. And that's what they're doing at the moment. Now the casualties suffered by the National Fire Service and the Auxiliary Fire Service, the AFS, during World War II were phenomenally high. These men went out and they helped fight these fires, but they would also stay behind often to try and rescue survivors in the rubble. Some of the most evocative images of World War II... It's only a bit of water. And we're not charging you any extra, by the way. No. That's free water, that is. The casualty suffered by these men was phenomenally high. In 1941, when conscription fully came in, you could be conscripted into the National Fire Service as opposed to into one of the armed services or the Merchant Navy. They considered the job of the firefighter that important because of what was happening. They had a lull, a break, in 1944, not as many air raids, and eventually they died out. But then, late 1944, a new menace appeared to put the men of the National Fire Service and the Allied crews under more pressure, and that was the first of the V-1 rockets, the Duda Bugs. The sinister sound of a droning engine, especially over the city of London, and then that engine would go dead like that. And then you didn't know where it was going to hit. And then you waited for the explosion. And that was the only thing that guided the fire crews to where they needed to go, was the explosion, and they knew that when they got there, there would be fire and there would be a lot of dead people. These things packed an incredible punch, something in the region of about 25 pounds of high explosives in each one. And they put shrapnel in there to maximise the killing potential of these bombs. So that got to be very good at knocking those things out of the air. Some pilots, if you would believe this, would use their wings to actually knock them off course. Right, ladies and gentlemen, I understand that unfortunately one of the casualties that was taken out of the building didn't make it. So, they're going to be moving 
They're going to be moving with uh, somebody, the city's personnel, up, putting them into an ambulance and taking them away to the mortuary. They did this for two reasons. One, obviously, it was standard procedure. But the second reason was nobody wanted to see somebody who had just died in the area where they were trying to save lives because it would really depress people who are seriously injured and they might not fight. They might not give everything to try and survive. So they would move the dead out as soon as possible. The fire marshal has just come over. He's the man actually in charge of all of these men. And he's got in there and he's had a look around personally. And he says that the fire is almost out. You can see there they're still putting water on it and down onto that fire to blanket it. But he's been in there. Once that fire is out, he knows that there are now no more people in there. At the far end of the building where the bomb struck, there's too much debris. Anybody who was under there is already dead anyway, because that was a direct hit. So what they will do is they have called out, they have listened, no sounds whatsoever. They have to make that assumption for the safety of their own men. It's a very, very grim business, this. But they handle it with great courage, and they always did. Now you can see the ambulance is there. One of the casualties himself, obviously a close relative of the woman who was killed, been loaded in there. There's one thing to bear in mind about war, ladies and gentlemen, it is never glamorous, it is never glorious, it is always horrible, it is always horrific, and it always leads to bloodshed, and it quite often leads to death as well. That's the grim reality of war. And we, as historical interpreters and reenactors, we realise that, which is why we do what we do. Because we want everybody to remember the sacrifices that were made on behalf of everybody here so that we can enjoy the life that we have. Because do you really think they'll have historical reenactment like this in Nazi Germany? Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Or if they did, it would tell a fascinating tale of history, trust me. Now the evidence is taking the fatality away. By the way, sometimes the bombs will fall so hard, such as on the 25th of May 1940, and again on the 29th of December 1940, they'd hit so hard in London in particular, they would create a firestorm. That happened twice in London. The area around the actual city of London, where Bank is today, was hit particularly badly. There were a lot of buildings set on fire. The fire reached an intensity such as the wind picked up and the wind generated by the fires picked up and it increased the temperature of the fire until the fire itself became a wind. That was a firestorm. The temperature within the centre of a firestorm reached 1,850 degrees centigrade. That's enough to melt stone and iron and incinerate people. A grim reality of this is, when Dresden was bombed, the aftermath, you can sometimes see horrific photographs of about 25 human beings in one bathtub. They had shrunk in the intense heat of the firestorm in Dresden to no more than a hand size. That's the reality of the firestorm and that's what some of these men had to face and had to battle during their time with the National Fire Service and the Auxiliary Fire Service. But now they have seen that everything has been taken care of. There are no casualties that they can ascertain within that building. They've been in and double checked now. There is no casualties there. The incendiary bombs used, of course, set fires in most of the major cities. Some cities fared worse. London got very badly hit, but not as badly hit, of course, as the city, the beautiful cathedral city of Coventry, which was devastated by a raid by over 800 German bombers and almost never recovered from that. But the people didn't allow that to happen. The people got together. First thing they did was they said after the war, we're going to rebuild the Coventry Cathedral. 
because all that was left was one single support stand of it. And they rebuilt that around that ruin so that people never forgot. Now you can just see there, up on top of that building, some of the soldiers who were here are now checking to see if there's anything up there. Very much a joint effort by everybody here. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to have a word after this presentation to find out more about the National Fire Service and the Auxiliary Fire Service and the ARPs, they'll all be based here in front of this where their vehicles will be parked. The police will also be here. If you want to know anything, ask a policeman. But all we're going to do now, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to line up everybody. And we have the ARPs, we have the soldiers, I can see there's a couple of soldiers there from the Polish Parachute Brigade. The Poles, of course, trained in this area as well. Where are the ladies of the WVS? I don't know, where are the ladies of the WVS? Would they like to come and join the line? If the ladies of the WVS are here, they can come and join the line. The lady on the end is the um, person that causes all the casualties. In case you're wondering about the lady on the end, she's the one who did the makeup for the casualties. <laughs> yeah, I would. I'd give her a round of applause because they convinced me. And besides, she's going a very nice shade of red by doing that, so. <laughs> Fire team! Left turn, shun! Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. These are the people who made it happen. A huge round of applause, please, and a big cheer for them. That's that's one. Sir. All squads, attention. Yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as they go away, if anybody does have any video footage that they have taken today, and they wouldn't mind sharing it with the NFS and the AFS on their website, we'd very much appreciate if you go and talk to the handsomely striking chap over there.